Well, again, we're so happy to see every single one of you in the house as we're continuing with our series, Crossroads. And if you haven't realized, this has been a series where we've just totally looked into the life of Jesus and how he reacted and responded in a very, very important time of history, but also a very meaningful time in his life as well. And that was the journey to the cross. You know, this series is going to culminate all the way up until Easter weekend where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the power of what he did on the cross and breaking free from the grave. But throughout this series, we've been looking at very honest, authentic, genuine moments where Jesus had to handle things that were coming his way because of the call that God had over his life. And many of those things that he experienced was painful, was brutal, was heart-wrenching, was disappointing. But in the midst of all of that, he chose to look at the crossroads and follow the will of his Father. And what I love about this series and this moment of, of time in Jesus' life is it makes him so relatable to us because in our life, we will face crossroads time and time again. Follow Jesus, live how I want. Follow Jesus, go back to how things were. Follow Jesus, follow myself or someone else. We will always be at a crossroad. And those are the moments where we want to run from God. But when we realize how much Jesus can relate to us and how much we can relate to him, it actually brings us closer. Crossroads in our faith are supposed to bring us closer to Jesus because it reveals his character, his nature, his goodness, and it causes us, by nature of who he is, to be confident and secure in Jesus Christ. And I think this series has really touched upon a lot of sensitive things, so catch up on the series online if you haven't yet. But more importantly, continue to process and share with your small group and your other trusted friends and family members what God is doing in this series. Because what he starts in this series, he's going to continue on. Amen? Tonight, we're going to be looking at another really heavy topic, but I think very relatable to all of us. And that's this topic of being wrongly accused. To experience persecution in your life when you did absolutely nothing wrong. And I think if we were very honest with ourselves, that's like one of the most painful things, right? where it's not just strangers, but in Jesus's case, it was some of his very closest friends or people that had witnessed just how good he was. And they were the very ones that were accusing him wrongfully, wanting to get him on trial, wanting to get him arrested, wanting him to die. This is what Jesus was experiencing. Unjust, wrong, unfair persecu persecution and accusations. Tonight, we're gonna to be looking at two passages specifically and we're going to kind of weave it together in how we are supposed to respond as Christ followers. The first one is going to be Matthew 14, or excuse me, Mark 14, 55 to 65. And this was Jesus' wrongful accusation from the chief priests at the time. We're also going to look at Psalm 23, 1 to 6, which was a psalm written by King David about just like the hardships he was facing and how he responded in the midst of it all. And I think as we read both, I think God is going to weave this beautiful story of what Jesus did and how he lived and how we, like King David, as normal human beings living on this side of eternity, how we can still find God in the midst of unfair persecution. It requires a lot of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read us the two passages and then we're going to open in prayer. Um, I share this all the time when I read the word of God. This is the word of God. It's living and alive as I am reading it. And as it's up on screen, or maybe you're going to be reading it from your notes, let these words come to life. Engage with it. Let the Holy Spirit kind of give you insight, vision of what these two passages perhaps would have looked like if you were there face to face. Because again, it's alive. So let's read. Mark 14, 55 to 65. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes 
Why do you need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Now we read Psalm 23, 1 to 6. Let this passage come alive too. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can we pray? Lord, this is your word. It is living and it is alive. We read in Mark how Jesus, your son, responded after being betrayed by the disciple Judas and after his disciples fled, we see how he responded to the false accusations. And then we see in the book of Psalm how King David handled the pressures of the enemies and the hardships that he was going to face. And somewhere in the midst of these two passages is a narrative and a story that you want to breathe upon us tonight. So breathe afresh, Holy Spirit. And as we read your word, I pray that your word would come in so personal, so present, that you would speak to the current places of offense and accusation in our lives, and that your word would bring a compass that brings direction, how we're supposed to handle it, so that we can continue to stay in your will, just as your son Jesus did. God, we simply ask for your will to be done tonight. Prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Turn to your neighbor, tell them God is good. All right, we're going to be reading again out of Mark 14, 55 to 65. And this is where it says in your notes, Jesus is unfairly and unjustly treated, yet he remains in God's will. Jesus' response reveals God's nature and promise to us in the midst of persecution. I'm going to read us our three points. We're going to loop back to point one, and we're going to let God be God tonight. Number one in your notes, it is in God's nature to provide peace and guidance. Point number two, it is in God's nature to provide comfort and confidence. And lastly, point number three, it is in God's nature to provide hope and strength. Back to point number one. And we're going to look at Mark 14, 55 to 59. It is in God's nature to provide peace and guidance. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Verse 59. Yet even in their testimony, it did not agree. Here's the thing about what was going on in this time. Jesus enters into the picture in year 30 of his life and he begins three years of ministry. And in his ministry, what he is doing is he is flipping everything upside down in the best of ways. We have the Old Testament that is coming forward into the New Testament times. And in the Old Testament, there was so many things that was based on law. And it wasn't necessarily based on love. It was still God's love, but the way that people enacted it was focused more on the law. And we also see a very strict focus on religion in the Old Testament. Again, not necessarily wrong. But what God is trying to reveal in the New Testament in his life is relationship and love. And you have these people like the chief priests and the Pharisees who begin to witness this Jesus guy become, become, begin to rise up the ranks. And because of his love and the way that he displayed the love of God and the example of God and he lived the way that we were all supposed to live and actually lived out the word that the Old Testament talked about, they began to step back and be like, oh my gosh, we feel threatened by what he's doing. Like he's coming in hot. 
Jesus is coming in strong. He is living with love, living with relationship. He is fulfilling the law and the religion of the Old Testament through his love and relationship present day. And these people who felt that it was their job to protect the word of God and live out the religion and the law and in response to that, justify outcasting people and deeming other people unlovable, outcasts. Jesus comes in and he's the very one going to those people. The people that upset Jesus the most was the people that knew about the law and religion but didn't live out love and relationship. He was flipping everything upside down. And the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, which was basically important people of the time, they didn't like that. What they wanted to do was they wanted to imprison and kill Jesus so that they could take back the power and control of that time. So they were watching Jesus, right? And how he lives all throughout the Gospels, we see it, the count through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you look at Jesus' life, he did absolutely nothing wrong. He lived out the law. He lived out the religion but he fulfilled it through love and relationship and he exemplified it with everybody that he came across. There was absolutely nothing that he could be accused of, but these people were so bent on making sure that he was no longer in power, they decided to come up with a way to get him arrested. So in this moment where Jesus is handed off to the chief priests and the Sanhedrin when Judas like identifies who Jesus is with a kiss and then kind of like goes away and does his thing, this is the beginning of them now trying to accuse him and just come up with something, just anything that could get him arrested and off the scene of the church at the time. They make this thing, right? Like Jesus says, I'm going to destroy the temples and in three days, I'm going to build it up again. And he's saying, the Sanhedrin is saying, like he's going to destroy something. He's evil. He's going to do something bad. He's going to destroy the temple. I just needed to say this because I'm like this Bible guy. I love reading into the Bible in these kinds of ways. What Jesus means in that moment, he's going to take away in three days the love of God only being in a temple because that's what they thought at the time. And when Jesus breaks through the temple because the stone was rolled away, on the third day when he would rise, love would build the church. He was just saying in those passages that he was going to build the church with his love when he breaks through and he comes back to life. And these Sanhedrin and chief priests are looking at that moment and trying to just find any little way to get him arrested by flipping something good. The love of God being able to leave the temple courts because God's love reigns now. Falsely trying to accuse Jesus. And so many of us, and this is me too, when I even feel like I'm slightly misunderstood by my spouse or a close friend or a family member, when my words get twisted, when that's not what I meant to say, but you're taking it that way, like I get really angry and flustered, right? Like that's our natural response. But Jesus, he's like kind of cool, calm, and collected. It's a serious moment for him, but he's, he's present to the moment. And he's witnessing what's happening and he's not shaken. And there's something about how Jesus' spirit and continence in that moment of being persecuted and wrongfully accused that we're supposed to see a glimpse of how we're supposed to also respond to those things as Christ followers and believers. But where does that come from? It doesn't come from us being able to justify ourselves or gather all of the facts of the situation or the amount of things we can post or the amount of people we can gossip or tell our stuff to. The reason why Jesus could kind of stand all of that was he had this thriving, genuine, authentic relationship with God. And we're going to dive into that right now in the book of Psalm because King David at that time also had a lot of enemies. He was the king. He was the chosen king of God's people at that time. And as he led, you had people like the evil King Saul wanting to kill him and take him out of power. You also have other nations wanting to destroy his nation or his leadership and take his nation and enslave them. And this human being named David, which we'll talk about at the tail end today, or really throughout, but we'll go back to him at the end. He figured it out. And the book of Psalm, Psalm 23, comes alive. How did King David handle, just like Jesus handled, all of the persecution coming his way? Let's take a look. Psalm 23, 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. When we are facing the hurricane of emotions and feelings and circumstances and situations and the what ifs and how comes and what will be in our mind that just bubbles up and rages, when we experience our enemies or just even people that we considered loved ones accusing us and coming at us with false accusations, every ounce of us wants to react and respond if we were super honest with ourselves. You punch me, I punch back. You talk to me like that, I talk to you like that too. You post about me on your Twitter feed, I will t tweet about you too. Our immediate response is to react and get revenge. But Jesus and King David, they kind of figured out that in the midst of that, they need to be led by God to a place of comfort or peace. How many of us would actually do that? Can I read again? Some of the active language from Psalm 23, 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. In the midst of accusations, there has to be this part of us that allows space from the moment to happen and pass. And in that space, instead of responding and reacting, we go before God. And we let him guide us away from the mess into a place where he can give us a message of his love. King David had to be led. Like this is a king. He had a lot of things to do. He wasn't just like twiddling his like fingers in his kingdom. Like he was actively a warrior and a leader and a poet and a God following. Like this is what he did. Yet he knew he needed to be led out of the mess of his circumstances and situations to the place of peace. And just look at the beautiful language, like still waters, green pastures, lying down. Why would my initial response or reaction towards getting accused be a place of peace? Jesus definitely knew because he was Jesus, but I think David also realized himself that in the midst of all of those kinds of things that can come our way, at our working places, in our marriages, amongst our friend groups, with our family members, with friends, with coworkers or classmates that are wrongfully accusing us for this, that, and whatever. There is something so Christ-like about stopping in that moment and instead of being like the world and responding and exacting our sort of revenge through words or actions, we actually pull back and say, God, you need to do work on me first. You need to let that blood pressure boil down. You need to let my breaths go a little bit deeper. You need to let my vein popping up on my temple begin to disappear and do it normally. Like you just need to be God and I need to be still. That's not our natural response. But if we let God lead us to that place of peace, whether that's your bedroom or a quiet park, or that car right next to the sunset on the beach, wherever your peace is that God would reveal himself in, let him lead you first before you react and respond. Nothing good out of our mouths come in the heat of the moment when we're angry and flustered. Sometimes it takes more fate to be restrained than to speak, amen? I've been married for four and a half years. That is still a process I am learning every single day. And that's okay in our walk with God because every single day is an opportunity to be more like Christ. Amen? Not by respect, re, re, reacting in the moment, but allowing God to guide us away from the moment so that we can have peace. Mm. What are those areas right now and who are those people that are popping up in your mind right now? Right? They're there coming up in my head too, thinking about some people. Some of you guys might be thinking about me, I don't know. What are those situations and circumstances that God is saying, no, 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 no. I know that's wrong and that's unjust and unfair, but come to the Father first, amen? Number two in your notes, it is in God's nature to provide comfort and confidence. Mark 14, 60 to 62. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? 
What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What's so significant about this passage is these people that were trying to accuse Jesus, like they realize, oh my God, like we can't, we can't even like hold him accountable based on the things that we're falsely accusing him on because he didn't like do it. They're like trying to scratch and claw for something that they can hold on to against Jesus. They were just twisting his words in the beginning. None of us like our words being twisted. But then this argument between them and Jesus begins to escalate on their side because they're getting angry. They're getting frustrated. They're trying to find whatever they can find to arrest him and like send him off. Jesus didn't do anything though. So now they begin to attack his identity. Are you truly the son of God? Are you really the blessed one? If you are, speak up for yourself. Like, isn't that crazy? Like they are coming at Jesus and they are making him give account to who he is. This is what the devil does to every single one of us because we're called to be like Christ, okay? Our role, our goal, our formation on this side of eternity, every single day as a Christ follower is to be more like Jesus. We are more aware that we are not like Jesus, but we are taking steps every day to become more like him. That is our goal on this side of eternity. That is who God is forming us to be in the image of God, in the image of his son. Sharing love through relationships, sharing the gospel with people that need it. But in the midst of all of these things happening, the enemy knows if there's one way that I can get you, if you do nothing wrong, I'm going to attack your identity. You're not a son of God. God could never love you. Satan even did that to Jesus, right, before he goes into his ministry. What causes us to rage oftentimes and act out oftentimes, is in that moment we forget who we are. We forget that we are chosen sons and daughters of the Most High. And we react and respond how we would have without that knowledge of who we are. Isn't that true? You know, there's so many times, and I'll just share, like in our marriage, we're learning. My, my wife and I, Chantal, like, man, marriage is tough. It's not easy all the time. It's great in many ways. But oftentimes it becomes the perfect vessel for two broken people to realize your brokenness time and time again and then choose because of the covenant that was made before God to choose love and forgiveness and grace every single time. And without boring you with all the details, I know for a fact that every time I step out of line in the way that I act or respond or my responsibilities as a husband and a father or even just a friend and a loved one, to some of you folks, every time I come out of God's will for my life, it's because I forgot everything that Christ has done for me to even have the kind of blessings that I have in my life today. When we forget who we are, that's when we look like the world. And the chief priests and the Sanhedrin, they were trying to make Jesus look just like the world. Get angry against us. Attack us. Do something. Are you truly the son of God? And I would say when it comes to our identity and our confidence in Christ, that is one of the most sensitive things to us, yeah? When people attack our identity. These people were going after blood with Jesus. Yet in the midst of all of that cool, calm, and collected, present, centered in, into the moment, choosing to honor God, his father. It's amazing how Jesus responded and how he reacted. Psalm 23, 4 to 5. And we're going to sit here for a little bit tonight. Again, this is the continuation of Saul or David's psalm in chapter 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So King David, right, after he leaves 
his throne and he's no longer king. He's just the son named David and he's lying be besides the still waters in the green pastures. He has this moment where he remembers his identity and he remembers the nature of God. Like, read this. Even in the darkest valley, like this was going to be Jesus' darkest valley. And King David had to walk through many dark valleys in his life as well. Yet King David continued to walk through them because he remembered whose he was. He knew that God would continue to protect him. His rod and staff would comfort me. He even says this, okay, like this is crazy to me. You prepare uh, before me a table in the presence of my enemies. Like David is so confident in who God is that he would protect him, that he would guard him with his rod and with his staff, that even if God led him in the darkest valleys on a table with his enemies, he would be protected. And we weren't just talking about random enemies that's going to like steal his cat, okay? Like we're literally talking about nations that wanted to take over his kingdom, aka God's kingdom. And David in the midst of just being away from the mess and before God in peace so that God could give him a message. He says this crazy line that God, even if you led me in the darkest valley and it would bring me to my enemies, you would still protect me. You know, there's so many times where we feel like we need to defend ourselves. And don't get me wrong, there are time and place we're going to have to stand up for ourselves in a way that is just, in a way that is right. That's for another message and another day. But in our day and age, in the moment, in the heat of everything, there are so many times where we want to react and respond. How our flesh says to react and respond. How our circumstances say we should be entitled to react and respond. But isn't it beautiful that this passage in Psalm is saying like, you're going to lead me to a table. A table isn't like a place where you're going to go to war. A table is a place where you're going to sit face to face with somebody. And God brings so much confidence to David that even if you put me and led me in your will to sit next to the person who is going to try to take over my country, my nation, your nation that you called me to watch, and lead and shepherd and care for. You got me. Your rod and, cap and staff comfort me. Bring me to that table with my enemies. It takes all of the pressure off of King David and it puts all of the power and the glory upon God. Again, another message for another day in terms of how do we justly stand up for righteousness in the heat of the moment or circumstances, situation. But for this message tonight, are we confident that even if God led us into the darkest valleys and that darkest valley led us straight to our enemies, would we still trust that God would protect us and that he would do the protecting and defending and that we can simply sit at the table and let God be God? That's powerful. Because I don't know who we feel like we're entitled to exact revenge on, but God is saying, no, no, no. Just sit at the table and let me be God. Amen? I know, man. Tonight's message is one of those kinds of messages. Now, going back to this topic of ident identity. This passage, or verse 5, ends with this. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You know why this is significant in terms of identity? If you look back in uh, 1 Samuel, when David first comes into like the picture, there's this prophet named Samuel, and he's trying to scope out by hearing God, who is going to be the king and the leader of God's people. And there's all of like Jesse, right? Like his, that was David's dad, and he had a bunch of sons. And so uh, Samuel was led to that family, and he's like, none of these sons are the ones that God has called, but... Don't you have another one? And David was the smallest, probably the least intimidating. He was just like a shepherd boy that kind of protected the sheep from like lions and whatnot. But Samuel picked him because God said him. And what God does or asks Samuel to do is anoint David's face with oil. That was the beginning of David's calling because he was anointed with oil. So I don't know what David was going through in Psalm 23, 
But after the peaceful place of letting God send him a message, what is he reminded of after everything is said and done? Even if the valley leads me to my enemies, you've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Basically saying, no matter what happens, this is my calling. This is what you have for me, God. And if this is what you have for me, God, my cup will overflow. Everyone say overflow. Turn to your neighbor, tell them overflow. Turn to your other neighbor, tell them overflow. Just say overflow. I know, man, like this, yeah, I get it. It's kind of a heavy message. But the reason why David was able to move forward in whatever he was called to do, and also why Jesus was, was because they knew time and time again where their identity lied. It was in their father. It was in God. It was not in the circumstance or the situation. It was not in the hardship or the trial. It wasn't in the truth of what was going on or them defending what they did or didn't do. It was simply in the fact that God is God and he is in control. And even if the circumstance or situation isn't happening the way that I thought or I feel entitled to or the way that I prayed, God led me here and he's going to take care of the rest. I am anointed by his oil. I am a chosen son, a chosen daughter. My cup will overflow. And whatever it is you may be facing in your life, whether it's an area of false accusation and persecution, or maybe just whatever it is that you're going through, God will never leave the cup. As long as you remember who gave you that cup, he will never leave that on empty. He will always fill it to overflow so that we remember. He's going to make a way. Amen? Last point in our notes tonight. Number three, it is in God's nature to provide hope. Everyone say hope. And strength. Everyone say strength. Mark 14, 63 to 65. The high priest tore his clothes why do you need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him away and beat him. What did Jesus get? By honoring God and stepping into the will of his father. What did he get? By allowing God to be God and him just allowing God to lead him into whatever his will would be for his son. What did he get? He didn't get justice. The Sanhedrin and the chief priest basically said whatever. Like, okay, well, he clearly didn't do anything wrong. We can't get him angry and upset so that he's going to do something wrong. Let's just arrest him anyway. Let's just do it. It's crazy. Jesus did the right thing, yet everything still went wrong in our eyes. Maybe even for a little bit, maybe in his eyes. But remember, in the midst of what God was doing at this crossroad of Jesus' life was this other narrative of redemption, of restoration, of hope, of healing, of wholeness that could only break through on the third day when the temples would be broken and Jesus would begin to build the temple once again through his love, not just in a physical building, but this whole world he came to save. Even though everything went wrong in the false accusations, God behind the scenes was doing something right. And we need to continue to tell ourselves everything that we face that goes wrong, that seems unjust and unfair. Yes, there's going to be times where God in the moment is going to bring restoration and justice. And we're going to be able to experience that and be happy about that and high five and like eat sushi after. Like it's going to be awesome. But there's also going to be times where staying in the will of God will mean it gets worse. But God's not a God who leaves us at his worst. Because his worst doesn't exist. He is a God that even through the darkest valleys, that even on the table with our enemies and his, it would lead us to his will and his goodness. Not just for this side of eternity, but in the eternity that is to come forever. Closing out the psalm from David. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to read it one more time. 
This is how uh, David sums up everything that he had heard from God. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew that after all is said and done, and if things don't necessarily get better after all the things that he had to face, on the other side of this, on the other side of eternity, would be the house of the Lord that he would get to sit in and be with God in for the rest of his life. That's kind of already a glimpse into the Easter story that Jesus faced all of the wrong things, the unright things and unjust things because of the greater narrative and the greater story of redemption that could only happen if he handled the persecution well and right. What are the narratives that God is trying to write in our stories tonight, in our lives tonight? Don't get angry. Let God lead you to still waters and green pastures, amen? He'll speak to you then, and he'll show you why. As we bring things to a close tonight, we're gonna watch a video of a gentleman, a young man at 18 years old. He was wrongfully accused of a murder that he did not commit. And he spent 20 or almost, I think it was 18 years in prison. 18 years for something that he did not do. Wrongfully accused, 100% unjust. But somewhere in the midst of his prison and this predicament, he had daily meetings with God in green pastures and still waters where he was walking through the darkest valley on the table with his enemies. Yet, he was reminded that he was anointed with oil and his cup overflows and that God would be good forever. It's powerful. Take a look up on screen. Standing by their son's innocence, CS's parents submitted numerous appeals and petitions to reopen the case. They were denied every time. As for Chris, instead of becoming angry and bitter, he chose to make the most of his time in prison. Whatever I was going to be at, I was going to serve him. I knew I was supposed to add value to the people, and, um, and this is what I had a chance to do in prison. CS did just that, and would grow as a dedicated follower of Christ. He led Bible studies, became an inmate pastor, and broke the record for number of baptisms in the history of Virginia's Department of Corrections. God is going to do this because he's the God of justice. Like, this is the book, and I believe the word. Yet the years continue to tick by and he was no closer to being free. In fact, even after the shooter issued a sworn affidavit confirming Chris's innocence in 2009, the court still refused to rehear the case. Seasons of um, depression and despair, um, being disheartened and dispirited, and I, I wanted to be home. Meanwhile, his family held fast in their prayers, clinging to any glimpses of hope. Lord, I'm gonna trust you. I trusted him so that Every year on Chris's birthday for 17 years, I bought him gifts. Because I was just looking for him to be home any moment. For over 16 years, C.S. read the Bible and prayed daily, leaning on God to get him through each day. He also watched the 700 Club. Of all the times he watched, one would lead to the break he needed. Yeah, after year of denial, um, November the 19th, 2019, it was probably my lowest point. And um, I, I remember watching the 700 Club and um, I, I heard Pat Robinson say, The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Meditating on those words as he prayed that afternoon, C.S. says the Lord gave him the name of a family friend, Bertie Jameson, a retired judge who served in Richmond. Chris told his mom, who reached out to Judge Jameson, asking if she had any contacts with the governor's office. She said it must have been God. She said because I texted her, and she looked at her phone and seen the text, and uh, she said she was sitting in the governor's office at the time. And so Governor Ralph Norman told her that if what you're saying is true, I'll investigate these claims, and um, we'll get Christopher out of there. On February 3rd, 2020, Chris was pardoned by the governor and released that April after spending 17 years falsely imprisoned. I cried and I, I rejoiced for the governor to exercise his power and say, nah, Virginia got this wrong. 
God then came through, I knew he was going to do it. Chris left prison with a clear name, a doctorate in theology, and big dreams for the future. Today, Dr. C.S. Wilson lives a life rich with gratitude and free from bitterness. I started my own tech company. It was just valued at $30 million. It is humbling um, at what God is doing. To be able to hug him, I longed for 17 years, and God had brought it to pass. He had 17 years worth of gifts, though. <laughs> he got me here. I owe my life to him. I'm dead to the alternative. You know, I'm here on account of God. Isn't that crazy? Can we give us some praise? You know, a lot of times in our life, we view the hardships and the trials and the persecutions and the accusations as like literal prisons that we're living in and prisons that we're experiencing. But what we see in this story, what we see in Jesus, what we see in David, and what we see through many Christ followers all around this world, is if we take these moments seriously as not just things that are bad that are happening to us, but opportunities where God could be God and he can speak to us in the midst, in the midst of what we're experiencing. Opportunities like this come up where God drops in a thought or a prayer or an opportunity for what went wrong to be a beautiful story of what God behind the scenes is making right. That is the power of the Easter story. That is the power of God's resurrection. And that is the power of what God wants to reveal in every single one of our situations this evening. Amen. I know some of us here, we may not be facing like a direct like accusation or something that was spoken to us that was false or untrue. Maybe for some of us, it's remembering things from our past, the things that people said to us or did to us back then hate to say this, but maybe it's going to be something that we take as truth today and we live out in the future when something does happen in our lives this way. It's not to put a damper on the fact that our lives and our love of God is good. It's just the reality of what we may face one day. Could be a coworker, could be a neighbor, could be a loved one, could be a stranger, could be somebody that just twists your words and your intentions, your identity, and tries to take it all away from you. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Remember who you are. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And you will walk through that valley. I will guard and protect you and comfort you. I will bring you to that table and everything is going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And maybe it won't be this miraculous story that CS experienced. But the story of eternity is one to hold on to every promise on this side. Amen. We're going to do this. A couple of things. Because we have quite, quite a lot of time to have a good response this evening. With all heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to do two things with a passage from Psalm. This is going to be the first one. Remember, all scripture points back to Jesus. And as crazy as it was for this to be written through a man in the Old Testament, I think there's something so much like Christ in how we are supposed to respond today in how Christ handled himself on the road to Calvary and the road to the cross. And I think this passage comes alive. So I want us to focus our eyes on Jesus and just already imagine Jesus living on the words of this psalm, reciting it in his head, maybe speaking it aloud as he is walking to the cross and carrying all of the burdens of everything wrong done to him in mind. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows surely. 
your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Continue to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. If there are those of us here who are facing a valley moment in our life, we are walking through the darkest valley because of false accusations or the actions of others that have been placed upon us that are hurtful, painful, that break our hearts in disappointment and sadness. Or maybe you're here and you're, you face things in the past and you feel like your life has been in that valley for so, so long. Can I kindly ask you to lift up your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. Hands going up everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. Keep those hands up. I'm going to read this passage one more time. And I want you to envision Jesus walking this passage out with you in your life right now, in the very circumstances and situations you're facing. Imagine this passage that King David wrote being a song coming out of your life, coming out of the moment where Jesus is enveloping you with his presence. And may this scripture come alive. God, you know the stories. May you bring healing. May you pour out hope right now as our brothers and sisters are reminded that you are with them through it all. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may put your hands down. God, I pray that in this moment, in this sovereign moment before you, that your presence would fill this place. And before we go into this moment where we sing a song, God, I pray that you would begin a song in our heart, of, a song of perspective, a song of direction, a song that leads back to the heart of Christ. God, I pray that for the chaotic, frenetic, all over the place spirit, that some of us have right now because of circumstance of situation that we're facing accusations or hardship, Lord, that you would bring us not just through the valley, but you would begin to give us the glimmer of light that's on the other side. God, I pray that that light would be enough to hold on to. And we are reminded that in your word, one of the reasons, God, that you came was you would break down the walls of a temple so that your presence could be felt in our lives everywhere that we go. And we are reminded that as we are going to witness and, and see God, the love of God one day firsthand in heaven, until that day comes, we will walk and walk and walk. And we will be reminded every step that you are with us and our cup overflows.